moving on to the last speaker of today, Eric Morgan. He's one of the co-founders, I guess, of BioAge. So, and BioAge is, uh, of course, one of the most exciting companies, I think, in the aging space, and are sponsoring the event. So thank you so much for coming and sponsoring and speaking. Thank you, Morton. And uh, thanks a lot to Morton and Alex for organizing an awesome conference. Uh, and uh, it's great to be here speaking today. So BioAge, uh, we're a platform-driven clinical stage biotech company advancing a portfolio of therapies uh, where we're treating severe disease by targeting aging mechanisms. Uh, we have a powerful human-first discovery platform, a uh, growing portfolio of uh, clinical stage programs, and a proven track record of results. Uh, this is why we exist as a company. It's to improve the quality and quantity of life for older people, um, like many of you here. And of course, we do this uh, by targeting aging because it's the uh, single most important driving factor for uh, the poor quality and quantity and, and morbidity uh, of life uh, as people get older. And clearly, uh, human lifespan and health span has not bumped up against any fundamental biological limits. There's um, a lot of room for us to improve. And uh, we want to do this for human health, of course, using uh, interventions um, that change the way people uh, age and change their quality and quantity of life. And so human aging uh, takes place on the timescale of decades. And so if we want to find the mechanisms to modulate, uh, to modify human health, we also need to study uh, human aging on the scale of decades. And so we do this with uh, longitudinal human cohorts and multi-time point sampling where we build multi-omics data sets and that kind of capability is really something that's only been uh, available and, and possible and uh, practical to do in the last <clears throat> decade or two. So this is um, you know a fast changing landscape where now we can study aging directly in humans. And we do this in a very data-driven fashion. So we collect data from these cohorts and we allow the data to speak to us. Um, and so in these uh, cohorts that we, we partner with and we phenotype, um, we're following people here for more than 45 years, um, more than 10,000 patients. We've generated in these particular data sets more than 65 million uh, molecular data points. And of course, we integrate even much larger sources of, of public data. And <clears throat> this is crucially paired with the right kinds of uh, human measurements and outcomes. Of course, um, lifespan, mortality, um, demographics, et cetera, but also key health span phenotypes. So how are these people faring as they get older? Um, how's their cognition? Um, how is their physical function, their independence? Um, and these are the kinds of phenotypes we integrate with the molecular data to identify you know, what are the important uh, pathways here that are really going to be impactful. And as uh, to illustrate some of the inputs that we generate from this data that go into our platform to map the biology of aging, um, this is an example of just uh, it's 5,000 proteins here plotted for um, you know, their association with longevity, i.e. mortality, and also with these little pie charts illustrating some of the other associations. So these are kind of um, molecule level associations, which is one form of input. Um, another form of input is the relationships between the molecules themselves. So what are the patterns of molecules and what do these tell us in an objective fashion uh, about uh, how pathways behave in the context of healthy aging cohorts. And so, you know, we derive these associations on the left. We can, you know, cluster them into, um, you know, mechanistically, putatively related groups, um, trim them down to, to um, remove more likely spurious uh, associations and ultimately build maps um, of, you know, clusters of related pathways um, that are uh, related in the way that they change with age and influence aging outcomes. And one benefit of this data-driven approach where we start in a hypothesis-free uh, sort of strategy is that not only can we look and identify mechanisms that fit into um, existing theories of how aging works, but 
we also have this potential to, um, to actually glimpse what's on the right of the graph there, of the, of the slide there, uh, which we're playfully calling the untracked wilds of aging biology. So maybe we can discover um, completely brand new uh, mechanisms and targets. So we have a number of internal focus areas for uh, developing therapies at BioAge, and today I'm going to focus on muscle aging and tell you about um, our program that has most recently uh, entered clinical trials. And this will also um, illustrate sort of, uh, you know, the pathway that a pathway takes as it goes through our platform um, to become ultimately a clinical stage program. Uh, so one of the things that we do here when we're looking for, uh, in this case, a muscle aging target is to construct scores that integrate uh, things like longevity and multiple outcomes related to physical and muscle function. Um, and you can see on this particular plot, one of the, one of the tail uh, proteins is apelin. And looking more deeply, we can sort of, um, you know, see in a confirmatory fashion that there is a dose-response relationship here between levels of apelin protein. Um, and on the y-axis, the, you know, prospective chance of not only living to a, uh, an old age, um, but also having a preservation of strength with old age. Um, this is uh, confirmed here by looking at these data-derived pathways surrounding apelin and looking at the pathway level associations, where again we see a, 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 a dose-response relationship between activation of that pathway and prospective risk of mortality. Um, and so this, you know, what I've just talked about is the human data from our platform, a few examples of what got us excited about this pathway. Um, and, um, and so what we did is we identified uh, an asset, a drug asset um, in pharma that was potentially available and was safe and had good characteristics and that um, we could use to um, start experimentally validating in animal models uh, this association. And so we did that and I'll, I'll talk later about that data, but suffice to say for now that it was, um, it was compelling. And so, um, you know, under an MTA, we had actually tested that, that specific drug in these animal models. And that convinced us, those results convinced us to in-license um, this asset from Amgen. Um, and we have now initiated a uh, phase 1b trial, which I'll also talk about uh, in a few slides. And so the um, overall context here for the Aplin pathway and how this works is that this is a pathway. So Aplin is an exerkine that is both secreted by muscle and one of the places that it acts is in muscle. Um, and young individuals have robust activation of this pathway, robust levels of ligand um, and great muscle function. Old people have less of all these things and old mice as well. And, um, and if we supplement BG105, which activates this pathway in old animals, um, it restores you know, muscle stem cell function, muscle regeneration, and ultimately you know, muscle mass and function as well. And uh, we uh, have worked on this with an excellent collaborator, Dr. Cedric Dre, who's an uh, Apelin expert. Um, and one of the things he helped us show here on the right is that like um, the endogenous ligand, um, BG105, is able to help mobilize stem cells um, and uh, the differentiation and accelerate ultimate uh, muscle generation after injury. So this is injecting mice with uh, cardiotoxin, which causes necrosis, and then we watch the healing. Um, and you can see here uh, increased um, you know, stem cell uh, activation and then increased uh, muscle area. And then the histology pictures show this as well. So you know, with Aplin, we're seeing better organization, better construction of fibers, um, and as well with, uh, with with BG105. Internally, we also did um, one of our favorite studies, which is to do long-term administration of a drug, this case over months, uh, administered in drinking water for mice. This starts with quite um, elderly mice um, and tracks their voluntary wheel running um, over time. And you can see here a you know, robust effect that develops where um, treated mice are uh, running more uh, than the untreated ones. And at the end of this period, one of the things we did was to test their forelimb strength and endurance by doing a grid hanging test. And the treated mice also had um, improved grid hang relative to um, control mice. Um, uh, one of the follow-up studies we did here was to induce muscle atrophy um, in middle-aged mice. 
uh, where we casted them and, uh, and the cast, casted one limb, and the casted limb, of course, atrophies because it doesn't move. Um, however, with administration of drug, we can see here that um, atrophy is almost entirely abrogated. Um, and really the uh, weight of the tibialis anterior muscle here in the casted treated limb is pretty similar to the uncasted limb. So this is really a you know, compelling set of data where we get you know, this great story out of the human cohorts um, that this is um, you know, a, an important muscle pathway with aging. The animal validation is really quite robust um, across these different um, experiments that we've done. And uh, that, of course, motivated us to in-license this compound. And we've now um, started dosing patients. And uh, so we're currently doing a phase 1b trial where um, you know, we're studying safety, pharmacokinetics, um, pharmacodynamics. We're looking, of course, at biomarkers, um, including proteomics. And uh, we're looking at mar markers of muscle function in uh, elder elderly volunteers who will be at bed rest and therefore um, uh, very highly prone to muscle atrophy during this period. And we're going to see what um, drug administration does in that context. Uh, and so we're excited to um, explore those outcomes. Um, a key uh, aspect of what we do, of course, is uh, feedback into our platform from these clinical trials. So as with all of our clinical trials, we are collecting uh, blood samples and we are um, feeding back into the platform the same kind of data we get from our health and aging cohorts. And this allows us the potential to, of course, confirm effects on human biology, like pharmacodynamic effects that we expect to specifically explore aging-related impacts and known aging pathways or putative pathways, and also derive uh, biomarkers that we can use for uh, planning future clinical trials um, and even potentially uh, inclusion or exclusion criteria, i.e. sort of ultimate companion diagnostics. Um, as our general approach uh, runs for our programs and you know, what their destiny is going to be in the clinical uh, development sphere is that we are starting uh, with uh, model indications that have rapid paths to commercialization, clear regulatory endpoints that can be evaluated in a, a relatively short period of time um, with a high degree of, of reliability of the endpoints. So um, for a muscle atrophy drug, something like um, ICU diaphragm atrophy, where in a very short period of time, due to atrophy, people are actually dying. And we could um, save lives by preventing that atrophy. But, but our ultimate goal is to address broad aging indications that affect everyone and really have a, a substantial negative impact on um, the health and uh, quality of life of older people like sarcopenia and frailty. Um, and so uh, this is just a reminder here for me to ask for help from the audience. We you know, have here a number of experts on clinical trial design, sarcopenia, and frailty. Um, and so we would love for some help to plan a, an effective, um, efficient, cost-efficient um, trial for sarcopenia or frailty. Um, and if you're interested in helping us with that, please, um, please speak to me afterwards or email me um, and uh, uh, we can move forward together towards something exciting. We think there's a lot of potential for this drug to really help uh, older people. Um, and so uh, it would be great to get some help with that. And so this is a, just a great quote from uh, Tenley Albright here. And uh, our aim should be to help our patients die young as late as possible. So. Uh, hopefully, we'll all move towards that together. All right. Thank you so much, Eric. That was really fantastic. Great. Thanks. Amazing uh, company. Um, do we have any questions? <coughs> Uh, great talk, Eric. I, if, if you said it, I didn't, I, I didn't catch it. Did um, the in the mice? Uh, did you get uh, increase in muscle function in young mice, uh, similar to as in old mice, or I think you said middle aged? Yes, yeah, so we haven't. We haven't, you know, conclusively validated this. But what we've seen so far in some of our groups is that uh, this pathway, as you'd expect from that biology, where this pathway is well activated in young and and essentially underactivated in old, that we really don't expect 
robust responses in young animals. So this is a pathway that's going to be much more effective for older mice. And we've seen some evidence of that already in our own hands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. More questions? I think people are ready for, ready for, for dinner. That's right. <laughs> OK. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.